Hi, I'm at, uh, here in Melbourne at Agilent Technologies and I've got Peter Daly with us and we've got something absolutely fascinating here. Bit of, uh, a bit of, well, a lot of history behind this, right Pete? Yeah, a, brief, a brief history of Agilent time. We, um, Agilent Technologies stopped making uh, atomic clocks about 10 years ago and we, we sold that division off to another company. Uh, our in-house standards here, the, the 5071s, have been in operation here uh, with our company uh, at different sites since about 1994. Prior to that, we ran off uh, this atomic clock, yep. which is a 5061 uh, so this cesium is model, beam tube. Model 50, 5061A 50, cesium right. beam frequency standard. It's uh, it, the company plant number two. Two. So the company inherited this, uh, this atomic clock in 1967 yep. uh, from Roseville in the States. Prior to that, it was used uh, in the flying clock experiments. Yes, now the, the flying, the flying, flying if, if you think back to the, the dawn of the space age, yep. which was certainly before my time, <laughs> uh, well, not quite, but um, at the dawn of the space, they, they needed synchronised world time. Yep. And they had these atomic clocks and they sent these atomic clocks around the planet, reference to the atomic clocks that stayed in Santa Clara. Mm -hmm. And they synchronised world time, but aside of it, because they sent the clocks in different directions around the planet and different places. Uh, they were able to do a calculation relative to um, what was in Santa Clara and they showed that there was, a, there was a trend that indicated that Einstein's theory of relativity was actually valid. Was actually correct. So Unf this is one of the this original is one of the flying clocks. atomic clocks. No, no, this is plant number two. There was, oh, this, there was right. a number of them. Oh, there was a number, number of them. There was a number okay, of them. so uh, they flew... A, a whole pile of them, of them a around whole the planet pile of them. in right. different directions. And each okay. one came back to the reference clocks yep. uh, and were measured against them. And we're talking a phase difference. They, they, they had huge batteries. Yep. You saw the first flying clocks that they did. There's some pictures on the, on the old HP webpage. Oh, right. uh, and they show a, well, it's a stratoliner, I think, with a, an atomic clock coming off mm -hmm. with a battery. <laughs> a battery pack. Because so you have to keep it continuously yeah, right. running for the yeah. whole otherwise, time. Otherwise, you put otherwise, it on the otherwise plane, if you power take it down, off. you lose it. Yeah. It becomes an unstable yeah. atomic clock, and you don't want you an don't unstable, want unstable atomic, atomic clocks. nuclei hanging around. So, well, no, that's. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> but, um, yeah, so yep. what they did, what they were able to do, they demonstrated that Einstein's theory of relativity mm -hmm. may be valid, but unfortunately, yep. the uncertainty of measurement was actually greater than what the trend was. So even though they had a linear, a linear progression, yep. the uncertainties associated with that measurement were greater than the linear progression. So, so technically, they didn't prove Einstein's uh, no, theory not so of much, relativity. No, not so much later. So but they got a real good warm fuzzy, right? Because it was trending did. in no, the right the, the direction. The trend was, that was, so that's my understanding. Anyway. Right. So this particular atomic clock uh, was, was one of the flying clocks. One of the flying clocks. Let's take a look at it, shall we? And here it is. Here and yes, folks, we are going to take the covers off. But um, somebody, I tweeted a photo of this, and somebody mentioned that they haven't seen one with a dial on the front before. Uh, up here. <laughs> that's a. That's. A is that a custom? No, no. That's it, that's, no, an, that's an, an, it's an option for it. So it's um, they they were, there was the fifty sixty one A. There was a an earlier version of it. Right. Um, the first, uh, now back in, again in 1967, mm -hmm. HP acquired the, the license for the manufacture or, or the patent for the manufacture of the portable beam, cesium beam tube, right. which is this magnetic tube here. Originally it was uh, uh, manufactured in conjunction with a company called Varian in the US. Who, uh, who were specialists in, in vacuum tubes and the like. They make plystrons and all sorts of really cool old stuff. Um, and funnily enough, Agilent uh, acquired a life sciences com company in 2010 and it was Variant. Variant. So, so that's how you ended up with this here. Well, no, well, yeah, yeah, that's, that's <laughs> that, a bit of synchronicity there, I suppose. <laughs> right. So, um, yeah, so that's just... And funnily enough, one of the, one of the guys from Varian. Um, that was the, the PhD guy that helped design this thing, was named Ron Daly. Absolutely no relation. No relation to Peter Daly. Uh, so, uh, yeah, right. so this is, this is the insert. This is high-tech 1960s vintage. Yep. If we look at the uh, manufacturing day, it's... Uh, look at that. It was made in 1962. 1962. 
1962. Well before I was born. Hey, so, oh, it was a good year. And it's 60. got a one pulse per second output. It's yeah. got 100 kilo, so it's got a divider output. Yep, um, the one pulse per second, it's, it's derived from the, 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 the LO. Now, when you talk about atomic clocks, and, and you'll, you'll hear numbers thrown out in the world that, that says an atomic clock will lose one second in 15,000 years, yeah. um, it, it's, it's a great claim. Uh, but uh, unfortunately, the, 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 cesium, the magnetic tube uh, is good for between 20 and 30 years. Right, so this needs... wouldn't be operational anymore? No. Right. No, it's, uh, it, it was retired uh, about 1994, I think, from memory, right. uh, and our and replacement cesium beam tube took over from it. Could uh, you refurbish them? These ones? It just, no. 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 Right. It's, it's, just, it's just out of support. If you look at the, if you look at the controlling um, the controlling in instrumentation associated with it, this is all done by computer now. Yep. Uh, it's, it's got its, its own microprocessors built into it. Still functionally the same. What you have is, uh, is a, a temperature controlled crystal oscillator, mm -hmm. which gives you terrific short term stability. That's yep. driven by a cesium beam tube, which, mm -hmm. which it's a phase lock loop system, but the cesium beam tube gives you terrific long term stability. Long term drift in conjunction, stability. In yep. conjunction with the short term stability of the temperature controlled crystal oscillator. Got it. It's fantastic. Right. So it's a cesium disciplined temperature controlled crystal oscillator. Uh, yeah, it's, yeah, it's a temperature controlled crystal oscillator driven by a cesium beam standard. All right. So. Um, the resonant frequency of the particular isotope, mm -hmm. you can look it up. It's, right. it's on the web. Google <laughs> is your friend in this case. Uh, we used to have a guy that could recite the, the resonant frequency to 14 digits, I think 14 digits, um, uh, but cesiums were his, his bread and butter. All so right. what else have we got in here? Uh, so that's your, your clock. You've got uh, power supplies. Yep. Uh, you've got the, the cesium beam tube. <coughs> is a vacuum tube, but it's, it's, it's a magnetic tube. Mm -hmm. It's got a, a magnetic uh, field associated with it, and what it does, it, it has about 7.5, 7 7.2 to 7.5 grams of cesium coated on the cathode of the tube. Yep. So that, for those of you that um, remember vacuum tubes, mm -hmm. uh, this, the cathode is at the bottom. What it actually does is boil that, s that 7.5 grams worth of cesium, cesium off, off, the, off the cathode over the life of the tube. Right. So it actually gets... Uh, gets transferred to the anode. And once it's all gone, you need a new tube. That's it. All right. Yep. As they get older, they become noisier. And oh, uh, noisier in what respect? Phase well, noise? As, yeah, yeah, phase right. noise. And so the, the phase noise that's associated with that aging, mm -hmm. because it's, it's uh, less cesium there and, and it's not boiling it off at the same rate, yep. um, over 20 or 30 years, you start to see that noise become a problem. Right. So, yeah, so that's... Whew. An there old you go. Atomic clock. That's it. Oh, it's got a lovely carry handle. Look at that. How it's much does this suck away? Oh, <laughs> a lot. I'd have to look it up. I'd have to look it up. I'd have to get my boss to lift the other, grab the other he other side of it to help me lift. <laughs> right. <laughs> that's so. fantastic. Thanks very much, Pete. All right. So that's good. That's it. Oh, a, port a portable, a portable CZ Move tube. <laughs> fantastic. Thanks, Pete.